Hello and welcome to People Goals Weekly Webcast, where we discuss the latest HR topics to help you thrive. My name is Maddie O'Neill, I'm an HR growth analyst here at People Goal, and today we're going to be talking about how to implement a new HR system. I hope you've listened to our previous webcasts. We've covered topics like HR trends for 2021, how to drive better employee engagement and how to enable a feedback culture. All of these and more are available on our website. Um, if you go to peoplecoal.com forward slash resources forward slash webcast, you will find all of these and more. So today I'm delighted to be introducing both Krissa and Kylie, um, who are going to help take us through the, today's topic. So if we could start with some quick introductions, that would be great. Over to you, Krissa. Hello, Madi. Uh, I'm Krissa. I'm an HR professional. I have been working for uh, high growth companies uh, the last seven years, and I'm very happy to join this webcast and share any ideas with you. Thanks, Krista. Um, I'm jumping in as well. My name is Kylie. I'm a customer success manager here at People Goal. So I look after the customers and make sure when new accounts join People Goal, they are all set up and ready to go with all of the resources and implementation support that they need. So I've implemented HR systems for about 200 of our customers at this stage, and uh, we'll take you through the key areas that you need to know from those experiences of implementing new software with HR customers. Great stuff, Kylie. I'm really excited to have you on board to share your knowledge with us. So without further ado, our topic for today is implementing new HR systems. HR software solutions help people teams to strategically improve employee performance, engagement and development. Implementing a new system requires careful project planning to avoid creating an admin headache for overworked people teams. So our topic for today is how to implement a new HR system. Today's webcast is going to look a little bit like this. We will start with an introduction um, explaining why you should have an HR system in place. Moving on to project setup and the need to plan, analyze and design your process. Next, we'll cover building and testing um, and how you need to document your processes to, and build pilot teams to effectively test before launch. Next, we'll go over some implementation top tips and how to prioritize launch communication and training. We will also cover support and how you need to gather continuous feedback and provide resources to your teams and finish up with some key takeaways summarizing everything that we talk about today. So great, let's start from, from the ground explaining what an HR system is and what are the types of HR systems. Uh, an HR system is uh, mainly designed to aid HR departments in managing people processes, policies, and procedures. There are two main types of HR systems, mainly uh, the HRIS system, which is Human Resource Information System, and Human Resources Management System. There is a key difference, however, between the two. So, for instance, uh, an HRMS system includes modules for, for monitoring and managing qualitative employee information, such as performance, engagement, and satisfaction, while a human resource information systems uh, helps manage people processes, policies, procedures, and data. So regardless of the type, HR systems are used to help businesses automate and manage human resources processes, help us run processes like payroll and benefits, recruitment, onboarding, performance, employee and training, and can be either be cloud-based or on-premises. On the purpose for using an HR system is to maximize employee engagement and increase operational efficiency. Krista, I'm gonna jump in on the uh, HR systems types. Um, so generally we'll talk about cloud-based systems because that's the way that most businesses are moving these days. It's a lot more flexible to run a cloud-based system, especially if you have multiple regions where uh, your data can be hosted uh, on the cloud. On-premise solutions are generally used by really large organizations who have to manage their data um, and probably have some legal requirements around data control. 
Um, and so for most companies, on-premise solutions are incredibly expensive and quite inflexible um, in terms of adapting their processes and, and being agile in what they want to run out to teams. So most of the uh, implementation that you will run will be a cloud-based solution um, and it has its own set of benefits coming with the cloud. Great, thank you, Kylie. Which is very relevant also for, for remote working uh, to have in place a cloud-based system so you can bring together people from remote locations. So let's move to the other slide and discuss the benefits of HR systems uh, for four different groups, for employees, managers, HR and people ops, and C-suite. So for employees, uh, the top benefits are the following. They provide, an HR system can provide role clarity. It can help understand better performance. So we can go back and see the history of our performance throughout the years and see how we grow within our role. Uh, it also improves employee experience. It increases engagement. It provides structured development and an opportunity to give bad feedback. Everything in a very well structured and defined framework. For the managers, it helps coordinate teams effectively. It brings team higher productivity and better employee engagement. Most important for HR people, for HR for people teams, uh, which are actually the owners of, of an HR system, most of the times, it helps automate time-consuming tasks, gather strategic insights, data-led decision-making, and improve the overall employee experience, experience and engagement. And finally, for, for C-level, for C-suite, it's, it helps provide uh, an overall reporting, a powerful reporting. They can have full visibility on goals and engagement, and they can gather better insights to make strategic decisions that are based on data. So now let's move to the project setup, how you actually go ahead with implementing a, an, HR, an HR system. First of all, you need to plan, you need to create a project plan that covers the timeline, the scope, the cost, and the stakeholders, the people that will be involved in the implementation. Then you have to analyze, you need to be benchmark your current performance management processes. You need to identify an ideal scenario and complete a gap analysis to see where you stand right now and where you want to be after you implement your, your HR system. And then for the design, you need to define the requirements, document the processes, be clear about the deliverables, and create a common language between the different stakeholders that may come from different backgrounds. So in order to be sure and successful on implementing an HR system, you need to make sure that you have a mutual understanding between the different stakeholders that are involved in the implementation of an HR system. So that's an interesting point um, about the different stakeholders that you would have. Um, and obviously, uh, the more planning that you can put into your project setup, I think the, the better your outcomes. But in those four key areas that we discussed on the previous slide, I, I think it's important to note the requirements for each of those four different uh, personas who will be using your system. Definitely. And then on the analyze side, um, there are lots of resources that are available for you to run an analysis of your current system. So um, you can set out a project plan, uh, you can set out a process map. And I think the more information that you can gather in the benchmarking stage, the better equipped you are to implement a new system, because you'll have a very clear idea of what works well currently with your current processes and the reasons for looking for a cloud-based HR solution. So if you've got all of those processes documented ahead of time and you've got a really clear idea of what your ideal scenario would be, that's going to set you up when you're doing your research on what system to implement and what your key requirements are going to be and how they're going to support those four different personas with all of their outcomes that they want to achieve. So 
So for a bit of background on uh, implementing a new system, this is a draft implementation timeline, and this would be an example of how we would run an implementation at People Goal, which would be generally a six week process. So that six weeks covers the time at which you have already selected a system. So you've chosen your HR software, you're ready to implement, and now we're gonna kick off our six week cycle. So this is where those requirements that you documented in the analyze section become really, really important because the more details that you've got down about exactly what processes you want to run and exactly what outcomes you want to see from those processes, the easier it's gonna be in terms of configuring your account to make this work for your people teams. So the account configuration stage will generally cover the setup of your team structure, um, the processes that you want to run within your HR system, and really, really important, the integrations that you might want to include within your account. Especially with cloud-based systems, integrations are so important because uh, people teams are running, I think the average is about 11 different HR systems alone, and you need all of those systems to talk to one another. So the more integrated your software can be, the better for your own project management um, and for having a really, really clear data source. Then once you've uh, done your first couple of weeks of account configuration, you're going to move on to your pilot team testing. Now pilot teams are really important for implementing a new system and your pilot team should be made up of various different stakeholders from your employees, the team leaders, the HR team, and also your C-suite. So depending on the size of your account, you really should have a group that covers a few different people from all of those different areas, because each of those different personas are going to have their own requirements from the system. And you want to make sure that the system that you've selected is really robust for all of those people. So it's useful to have a pilot team also who have varying different levels of technical ability. Um, and that's important to make sure that your system is really user friendly and that it can be used by people who are really technically capable, but is also easy to use for someone who's not so familiar with HR technology. Pilot team testing can take anywhere from two to four weeks, depending on the complexity of your processes as well. So this timeline is really fluid and it will really depend on the complexity of the software that you're going to install. Um, really important with the pilot team area as well, which we'll go into detail in the next slide, is to be gathering feedback um, and making changes to your process. So you need to be flexible about the different types of processes that you can run. And it's, that's why it's important to have documented your benchmarking, but also your ideal scenario so that you can see what are the key requirements that we need to achieve. So once your pilot team testing is done and you're all set up and ready to go, that's where you're going to start to do a launch to your full company. And the most important thing about launching a new system is communication. So explaining why you've chosen the system, what it means for everybody who needs to use the system, and then providing training and onboarding support. Often this will be uh, supplied by your HR systems provider themselves, whether that's a support center with documentation to help you or live training options. It's really important that you offer different types of training for your different user groups so that they, they feel really supported uh, in rolling out the new software. And then after you've launched, um, you're going to go into your monitoring stage. So again, important to gather feedback from people, take on board the recommendations that people have or the areas of improvement that they want you to implement. And you can then factor that into the adjustments of your processes and making sure that you monitor usage that's in line with what you expect for your performance cycle. Great. So Khalif, from your experience, out of the four main steps, that which is the one that you know can take much, can last longer and take you out of your plan? That would be the pilot team testing for sure. So, you know, HR teams are, I think, quite idealistic and they'll have this really, really nice system planned in their mind that works for the HR team and that's all done in the account configuration stage. But then once you get your system in front of actual real life users, you'll start to see where there are gaps, uh, where there are improvements to be made. And so that pilot team testing will definitely take you the longest. Great. Uh, and back to the project plan, where do you see the gap for the pilot team testing? So what HR teams need to consider in order to have um, 
and more smooth pilot uh, team testing. Yeah, I, I would bring in an idea of your pilot team in the benchmarking stage. So when you're doing your analysis of systems, um, we have a couple of resources to help you with benchmarking a performance management system. And that can be really, really simple, just a, a feedback form that you send out to people to get their thoughts on what works well within performance management and what they would like to see. So if you gather those requirements up front from your different stakeholders and build that into the analysis stage of your project plan, then once you get onto the pilot team, you'll already have an idea of what their pain points are and, and uh, what they would want to see on a system. Great. Uh, so once you head out into your build and testing phase, this is where you are going to get into the meat and bones of your HR system. Um, so starting at the beginning, the process design, really, really crucial. Again, you would have mapped a lot of this out in your planning phase, so in the project analysis and design phase. But now that you've got your system in front of you, I think you'll find that there are often a few discrepancies between what you had in your head and what the system can actually do. And to go back to something that Chris has said earlier, that's why it's really important to try and create a common language between stakeholders before you even get to this phase. Um, it'll, it'll help you to know, you know, what people are actually talking about when they say that they have this requirement. Getting as much detail on that as possible is, uh, is, is really helpful to then build into your process design. So from the processes themselves, um, it's also good not to just think through the actual steps. So if we think in terms of performance management, um, you know, setting up an OKR system is great to, to think about how often you're going to set OKRs, at what level they're going to be set within the business but also have an idea of what your key outcomes are going to be. So what does it mean to run these, uh, these HR processes for your company? And I think that's an area where a lot of people kind of, you know, they run through the process steps and, and they know what the best practices are there, but what does that actually mean for someone to use your HR system? So the outcomes are really important, whether that's, you know, what happens after a performance review, um, what do we do with ratings? What does it mean for employees to run continuous feedback? I think when you're designing your processes, always have an idea of what the end picture is. Now, the process design will depend on obviously how many processes you're running, how complex they are. And uh, as the initial build team, so your HR people ops who would be the account owners on a system, you will probably be running a few processes yourselves before you even launch that to the pilot group um, and uh, getting an idea of, of the flow of your HR workflows. So once the processes are all in place and you, you've got a pretty clear plan about uh, what it is that you're gonna run on your account, now it's the time to bring in the pilot groups in to test the account. Um, I wouldn't be too worried at this stage about having everything perfect and final because the, the point of a pilot group is to gather feedback and to be able to change the processes to make them more relevant for employees and team leads particularly. So, you know, if, you're, if your processes are not looking completely ready to go, that's absolutely fine. You can bring your pilot groups in um, and really kind of get them uh, stress testing the system and uh, getting to know the different processes that you have set up within your account. Uh, within the pilot groups, I think um, it's really, really important to have employees and team leads included in that. With the C-suite, um, obviously being you know, very busy people who uh, are, are not inclined to spend too much time within the system, the key area for them in piloting is to make sure that they're getting the kind of reports that they need out of the system. Um, and that's one of the main benefits, going back to what Chris has said earlier, of, uh, of, of HR systems for the C-suite, is for them to have a really nice top line picture of uh, what's actually going on within the company. And having those reports available will allow them to make strategic decisions um, and to have an eye on what's going on within the business at all times. So, you know, when we think about performance management system and the pilot groups, we might not necessarily involve a C-suite with a full goal setting cycle. We might just involve them in piloting uh, to make sure that the reports that they're getting out of the system are what they wanna see. Now, after the uh, pilot processes have been run, you're probably gonna make some changes. Um, and that's where you're gonna come into the user acceptance testing stage. So UAT stands for user acceptance testing. That's really about stress testing the system and trying to run every possible scenario that you can think of um, uh, in terms of your HR processes. 
I guarantee you, you will never cover every single use case um, in this stage. Um, but, you know, if you were aiming for that sort of thing, your project implementation could take months up to a year. So the UAT really should be running the more refined processes that you've changed based on the feedback from the pilot groups. You might bring in another pilot group after this to uh, do the UAT as well. And the point here is really to get to a stage where you're willing to sign off on the system and say, yep, we're ready to launch with this. We're happy with the way that these processes are running for now. Um, and now we're going to get ourselves set up for our soft launch. And then really, really important in the building phase, and although we put this last, it really should happen at every stage of the build and test cycle, is to gather feedback from people. Now, you don't need to be really complex on this. There doesn't have to be a formalized system for gathering feedback. Um, the way we've done it with a few teams is just to have a, a completely open Google Doc where people can note down free text feedback, can log areas of concern, um, and, and really what you want out of here is just to, to get ideas from people of what works well and what needs to be improved. Um, so going into this, you need to have a quite a flexible mindset. Um, the ideal HR process that works for HR teams might not necessarily be the ideal process for actually benefiting employee and manager development. So you need to be flexible about what's actually going to work um, and what's going to be accepted by your people teams. So now building on what Kylie has taken us through, I will be discussing how a rollout in your organization is actually going to look and the various steps that ne you need to do to ensure a successful rollout. So starting off um, with systems, you need to migrate your data from existing systems that you might be using maybe this is ADP, Active Directory, um, Bamboo HR. You might have an HRIS in place which stores all your employee data um, and then this can be imported into your new system. This will save you loads of time as um, updating employee information one by one will take ages. So um, you can use a connection to migrate the data across to save you lots of time. Next, it's really important to consider what integrations you're going to use, as Kylie mentioned, um, the more integrations you have within your software set, the better it will be for, in, for employees. So one thing we would suggest is integrating the new system into the employee space to ensure that the system is actually being used, whether this be by setting up um, Slack notifications or Microsoft Teams notifications. It really depends what systems you're already using. But having these automatic notifications will encourage employees to use the system, something that they might not have done before. Yeah, I want to build on that as well, Maddie. It's just something that we've seen that that, that makes uh, an implementation really successful is um, bringing your HR system into the flow of work. So uh, there's a common misconception from employees and managers that uh, performance management particularly is extra work that they need to run. Uh, it's a box ticking exercise and it's really for HR only. Um, so th the easiest way to get out of that mindset is to show employees and managers why setting goals and having project plans are really important um, and not having them kind of have to jump between loads of different systems in order to make that happen. So if your HR system has an integration with whatever communication system you're currently using, that means that, you know, the way we run it is to use our people goal Slack bot. And instead of logging into people goal, we can send a quick message to the Slack bot. Um, and that means that it's not interrupting you from the current work that you're doing. And it's really becoming an addition to the work and helping you to be more productive and focused. Absolutely. And it's, it's a really useful integration there. Next, we've touched on this a lot already, so I won't go to too much detail, but testing, um, especially these integration, integrated notifications as well. And um, it's important to keep in mind that these will need to be tested by your teams before rollout. Um, also, communicating all of this to your employees is really important and making sure that they have the information needed to effectively use the new system. So we touched on before distributing information from a support centre or even making an information pack to send to employees detailing exactly how to use the system, how to log in, how to kick off those processes, goal setting, reviews, for example. And these might be different for employees and managers who have different roles and responsibilities within the platform. And also um, run, running user specific training sessions. These can either be done by the admins on the account if they feel comfortable, or this can be 
done by the third party provider, um, this might be the best way as it will probably be slightly clearer having professionals explain the system to your employees and managers. Um, and also these training sessions need to be user specific. And what we mean by that is separate training sessions for employees and managers, as they will have very different roles and responsibilities within the account. Yeah, and I think that's one of the most important areas, Maddie, when you're uh, rolling out a new system, um, rather over communicate than under. So having lots of different resource types for different types of learners is really important, but also in your communication. And it's something that people gloss over because HR understands why you're implementing a new system. But you need to make it clear to your people within the company of, of what what are the reasons that you chose to go with an HR system and what are the what are the benefits for employees and managers? So in terms of the communication, be very, very clear on the outcomes that you expect from people, how often you expect them to use the system, how often you want them to be running the different processes, but also explain what the benefits are for them and the reason that the company wants to use an HR system. Definitely, and that will really boost um, engagement rates with, with such systems. Another tip that we have for you is when you pick your go live day, try and think strategically, um, picking a quiet day to launch the system where um, employees and managers have the time to engage with it and also publicizing well beforehand that this is the day where the system is going to go live and encouraging everybody to log in and start using their account from day one will be really helpful. And finally, we suggest that you track the usage of the system um, and see if your employees, managers are logging in, see if they're creating goals, reviews, sending in surveys. And if you notice that the usage is quite low, then it might be necessary to provide some supplementary training, rather, whether that's in-house or externally, um, just to ensure that people are using the system that you've spent so long implementing. Great, and then uh, once your system is implemented and rolled out, uh, it's really important to keep the momentum going um, and to see it as a, as a live system. So, you know, the best HR systems are gonna be flexible, they're gonna be agile, they're gonna allow you to make iterations of your processes and really grow within the company um, as, your, as your business expands. So the key ways to run that is to offer ongoing support um, from yourselves as people ups, but also from the system providers as well. Um, so this can cover things like onboarding new employees into the account. Um, don't take it for granted that they're just going to understand all of the systems and they're going to know your ways of working. Really important to uh, provide them with the proper training, um, ideally the same sort of training that you did when you launched the system to the whole company. So keep in mind new users joining throughout the year. Um, and also one thing we found really effective is uh, having kind of open office hours or lunch and learn sessions around key performance dates if we're talking about a performance management system. So if you're running annual reviews, for instance, it's always nice to have a couple of workshops. They don't need to be formal. They don't need to require a lot of preparation, but just have an open space for employees to come and raise concerns, get a reminder about what these processes mean for them um, and have a conversation with people ops as well about what's expected. And then really crucial is to uh, get those feedback um, and improvements ideas as you run your processes. So this is what Maddie was touching on earlier about um, gathering continuous feedback from your users. That can be an ENPS, which is an employee net promoter score. Um, generally, ENPS is used for employee engagement, but it's such a simple system. There's no reason why you can't apply it to your software as well. Um, and then you can have regular check-ins with different user groups and uh, you can run regular pulse surveys as well. So there are lots of different ways of tracking usage within the account and it's all going to depend on your outcomes that you documented right back in the planning phase and also where you want to actually see performance and development improvements within your employees. Great, so thank you Kylie, thank you Chrissa for your insights. Um, it definitely cleared up quite a few things about implementing a new HR system. So now we're just gonna round off with some key takeaways, um, the, the key points that you need to bear in mind when you're implementing your new system. So firstly, going right back to the beginning, ensure alignment and mutual agreement between stakeholders before implementation. This one is really important because if there is some misalignment, the problem will only get worse as you move down your implementation timeline. So it's really important to get this right first time. Next, allocate sufficient time and resources for testing. I think that's something that's come 
through quite a lot in this presentation, that testing is really, really important as it's going to help you make those necessary improvements to get the most out of your system. Also, when you're pilot testing, group different users together and be aware of their individual needs, whether they're an employee or C-suite, they have different requirements and needs from the platform. Um, so just bear this in mind when you're doing your testing groups and make sure you test across the different buckets. Next, have an open policy surrounding questions, encouraging employee in questions and user questions is a really great way to make sure people engage with the software. And finally, provide ongoing support for system users, as Kylie just was talking about. See it as an ongoing system, not as a, a finished process once it's implemented. It's something that's going to grow and change as your organization grows and changes. Yeah, I think that's a really key point um, across the entire implementation cycle is to, to have a flexible mindset. Um, you know, you can have your, your ideal system in your mind, but if you're not flexible about uh, different requirements and making sure that you can cover different user groups, I'm afraid you're going to have a system that people just don't want to use. So you need to be flexible in your, in your thoughts and, and be adaptable to change processes. Because the ideal outcome with HR is that you have more engaged employees um, who feel more autonomous and in charge of their own development and who ultimately are more productive. So whatever system will allow you to get those outcomes, that's going to be your ideal system. Great. And a final note from my point of view, I would suggest that we need to take seriously the implementation process because we set up a system for people, a system that will be used for many years and if implemented successfully, will contribute to employee increased performance and engagement. Therefore, uh, as HR professionals, we need to invest time in this process and not rush into, you know, uh, closing any, any step fast within the implementation cycle due to other deadlines or workload that we may have. Because implementing a system is very important and if done correctly, will pay off for, for many years to come. And that's all from us in terms of content. If you would like to get some more people goal insights, feel free to download the research slides, check out upcoming and on demand webcasts at peoplegoal.com forward slash resources forward slash webcasts. And if you'd like to connect with us on our social media, find us at people goal on LinkedIn and on Twitter. And here are some further resources if you would like to learn more about this topic from our blog and one of our white papers. Our white paper, Modernizing Employee in Performance Management in Medium and Large Organizations, covers a lot more on the planning side, if that's something that you would like to know. Also, our blog posts, How HR Software Creates a Positive Employee Experience, and our top 10 HRMS, HRIS Systems, a 2020 Definitive Guide. Finally, if you want to suggest a topic or be a guest in one of our upcoming webcasts, send me an email, maddie.oneill at peoplegoal.com. Thank you very much for listening and thank you, Kylie, and thank you, Chrissa. Thanks, Maddie. Thanks, Maddie. Thank you, Kylie.